the God of the temple, that you have included us, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and love you as your temple, and that your Son taught us to say, Our Father. Would your name, would you glorify your name amongst us tonight, we pray. For we know that all glory belongs to you and to you alone. So speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, my reading that I'm going to do this evening is uh, 2 Kings chapter 3. 2 Kings chapter 3. And uh, I'll be speaking under the heading of Digging Ditches, Unearthing Grace. 2 Kings chapter 3. Now, while you're getting 2 Kings chapter 3, here's an interesting bit of history. The Moabite stone was discovered in 1868. It contains the Moabite inscription that informs of many of the events of 2 Kings chapter 3. And yet, because it's written by the Moabites, it has a distinctly pro-Moabite spin to it. And I'll come back to that at the end of the sermon. Let us read from verse 1. I'm reading from the NIV. Jehoram, son of Ahab, became king of Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And he reigned twelve years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father and his mother had done. He got rid of the sacred stone of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which had caused Israel to commit and did not turn away from them. Now Mesha, king of Moab, raised sheep. And he had to pay the king of Israel a tribute of a hundred thousand lambs and the wool of a hundred thousand rams. But after Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So at that time, King Jehoram set out from Samaria and mobilized all Israel. He also sent his messengers to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? I will go with you, he replied. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. By what route shall we attack, he asked. Through the desert of Edom, he replied. So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. After a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or their animals with them. What? exclaimed the king of Israel. Has the Lord called us three kings together only to deliver us to the hands of Moab? But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. In other words, he was Elijah's personal servant. Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Elisha said to the king of Israel, Why do you want to involve me? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. No, the king of Israel answered, because it was the Lord who called us three kings together to deliver us into the hands of Moab. Elisha said, As surely as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not pay any attention to you. Now bring me a harpist. While the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came on Elisha and he said, This is what the Lord says. I will fill this valley with pools of water. 
It's uh, in the NIV, just as a slight digression. Um, in the King James Version and in the original, it says, Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches or trenches or better still pits. For this is what the Lord says, You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and you, your cattle, and your other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also deliver Moab into your hands. You will overthrow every fortified city and every major town. You will cut down every good tree, stop all the springs, and ruin every good field with stones. The next morning, about the time of the offering, for offering the sacrifice, or as in others as well, the grain offering, there it was, water flowing from the direction of Edom, Edom, and the land was filled with water. Now all the Moabites had heard that the kings had come to fight against them. So every man, young and old, who could bear arms was called up and stationed on the border. When they got up early in the morning, the sun was shining on the water. To the Moabites across the way, the water looked red like blood. That's blood, they said. Those kings must have fought and slaughtered each other. Now to the plunder, Moab. But when the Moabites came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and fought them until they fled. And the Israelites invaded the land and slaughtered the Moabites. They destroyed the towns, and each man threw a stone on every good field until it was covered. They stopped up all the springs and cut down every good tree. Only Kir Hariseth was left with its stones in place. But men armed with slings surrounded it and attacked it. When the king of Moab saw that the battle had gone against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through to the king of Edom, but he failed. Then he took his firstborn, who was to succeed him as king, and offered him as a sacrifice on the city wall. And the fury against Israel was great. They withdrew and returned to their own land. Let us pray. Lord, we long to look into your word tonight. And so we ask you, please illumine our sight. Open our understanding so that we are able to see your chosen way. Lord, both in a historical perspective but also for the present, for us to walk in. Allow us not to see or hear words of man. We thank you for Jeremiah when he said these words in chapter 6. This is what the Lord says, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But, Lord, we know that that verse goes on. And so we ask that you would help us to walk in the good way. For we know that the next words in that sentence are simply, but you said, we will not walk in it. And so we ask this evening that you would remove our stubbornness and our pride. And indeed, every sin of word, thought, and deed so that we may hear you speak. Amen. Perhaps a little bit of background. First, uh, you've, we've read the whole chapter, but the uh, people that are in this um, battle, in, in the Moabites and the Israelites and... Uh, the house of Judah and the Edomites. Let's just start there. First of all, there's Jehoram. And we know that he was the son of Ahab. And we know that Ahab was one of the worst kings in the northern kingdom because we know that the northern and southern kingdom had split already into two. We know that his mother was Jezebel. And we read in 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25, where it says, there was never 
anyone like Ahab, who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. Wow. That's uh, quite a saying. Huh? There was no one, never anyone like Ahab, who sold himself to do evil. So here's Jehoram, and he's not quite, I suppose it's difficult to say as bad as his father, because, um, you know, he had um, done away with some of the balls, but he was renowned because of his false worship of Jehovah. He went for a kind of political strategy rather than a religious one, according to Dilday, one of the commentators. That's the first person. The second person is the king of Moab. Now, Ahab had died. Ahab had been strong. And uh, Moab had been a vessel of Israel. Now, the Moabites, we know, came from came from Lot and Lot's eldest daughter after Sodom when they made their father drunk and then way, went in and lay with him. And the result was with the eldest daughter, the children of Moab. But here's a, here's a man and he's indebted to the Israelites to the tune of a hundred thousand lambs and the wool of a hundred thousand rams. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not much of a farmer, but even in today's uh, terms, that would, be, um, that would be fairly steep to pay each year. And so he rebels. The third person is the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. And we read that Jehoshaphat was a godly king. We just go to Kings 1 Kings 22, verse 43. In everything, he followed the ways of his father Asa and did not stray from them. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed, and the people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense. So here's Jehoram, and he comes to the king of Judah, and he says, will you go with me to fight? And the king of Judah says, of course. There's a question um, of the ungodly coming to the godly when the chips are down, isn't it? And he comes to him and says, yes, you'll come with me, but which route shall we take? Acknowledging that Jeroboam had, uh, had far more practice as uh, a leader of the army. And so he says, we're going to take a roundabout route through the desert of Edom, seven days march. And they march for seven days. And what happens is, the end of seven days, they've run out of water. Now, every good army knows that if your supply lines are compromised, you're going to be cut off. Whether it's ammunition or food or whatever it may be, you are in danger. So here is Jehoram, and he's thinking to himself that God has brought them out into the desert and that the Moabites will defeat them. So they're stranded. What do you do? You're between... Well, I don't want to use that term, but the devil and the deep blue sea, because this deep blue sea was actually the Dead Sea, which was the border of Moab. And so they'd come up through the desert, and Moab was to the east of the Dead Sea, and now they are in trouble. 
And as I said, Jehoram's guilty conscience convinces him that great calamity waits on them as a judgment from God. So let's have a look at um, a heading that I'm going to be using tonight. Um, pointing it to the wall again, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> and the four points I'd like to highlight are seek, sing, summon up. I want to um, just clarify summon up. This isn't, um, this isn't Saul going and asking Samuel, who had passed away, wanting to summon up with the witch of Endor from the dead. This summon up is really remember, call to mind. But the only word that I could find with an S was to summon up. And I hope that uh, you haven't taken it and this, and then to slog away. And slog away really means to work really, really hard at something. So let's have a look at, verse, at the first point. Seek God's guidance and know his will. So what does godly Jehoshaphat do? His advice. His advice is simple. Is there a prophet of the Lord here. That's what he asks. Why? Because he's seeking the will of God. Jehoram was not seeking the will of God. He kind of thought that they were in crisis mode. He thought God might need it to be avoided. But Jehoshaphat believed that um, they needed to seek God and find his word. And then he hears that Elisha is there and uh, that he had served the great prophet Elijah as well. And Elisha recognizes the presence of Jehoshaphat. And so he calls for a harpist, and he waits on the Lord. And then in truth and sincerity, he passes on God's word to the three kings. He has the word of God. Make this valley full of ditches, for this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and you and your cattle and your other animals will drink. This is an easy thing for the eyes in the eyes of the Lord. He will deliver Moab into your hands. They have confirmation that God will be with them. Now, the second point is to sing. And I think we need to look at this slightly differently. I know that Elisha called for a harpist. You'll recall that Saul also found that the Spirit of the Lord was with him and he had peace even when he was wanting to throw a javelin at David to pin him to the wall, David would play and peace would wash over King Saul, who had, God had removed his spirit from him already. I don't think that we must ever underplay the great importance of music in our worship and in approaching the throne of God. After all, you know, Paul says that very much so in Ephesians 5, 18 to 19. And you know it well. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to reckless indiscretion. Instead, 
be filled with the Spirit. And what must they do? Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? I have a, a very good friend who says to me that when things are really tough and she listens to hymns and spiritual songs and reads the Psalms of the Lord, she is at peace. Here's a quote from Poole, one of these that commented on this. When he requires, that is Elisha, that his mind has been disturbed and may be inflamed with holy anger at the sight of wicked Jehoram, and he wants it composed and cheered and united within itself that he might be excited for more fervent prayer with God and joyfully praising him, and so whereby he was prepared to receive the prophetical announcement. I wonder if we sometimes take a shortcut we don't seek. We, we just uh, sort of bumble on in our own understanding and we think our own wisdom. And we don't sing. And we don't seek God. We don't wait on God. What is impossible for you and is impossible for me is entirely possible with God. And so we're told in point three to summon up or remember God's power. It says this is a simple thing, an easy thing in the eyes of or the sight of the Lord. I don't know how many there were in the army, but there were three lots of men. I don't know how many animals they had with them, but they needed water. And the blessing of water was not primarily what God wanted for them. He had promised them victory over Moab. A simple thing for God. We stand today in this world and we say COVID-19 is actually a simple thing for God. Or we say this country of ours, we heard this morning of our president signing into law that all government officials have to, in spite of their conscience, do same-sex marriages. And that doesn't apply in the church, fortunately. Not yet. But where will it go? We know for argument's sake that in New Zealand they've just passed a law. I don't know if you heard it. That if you are old or terminal, you may choose to end your life. As long as you within a six-month window of dying, you can euthanize yourself. When all of these things are easy or simple for God, and we make them so difficult, and so it says, summon up, remember God's power. What do you remember about God's power? Who created the world? By words. Who holds the world in its place? The universe. The Lord Jesus Christ. By his word. Who created the waters and the animals and the birds and the fish? God. Who brought a flood that covered the world? God. Who kept Noah and his family and the animals, God, in an ark, 
We said that sounds just too incredible to be true. Who worked wonderful miracles in the land of Egypt? From the river turning to blood to the death of the firstborn, God. In Egypt, but not in Goshen where the children of God lived. Who went before them visibly in a cloud of smoke and a pillar of fire. In full view of them, God, because it's a small thing for God. Who took them across the Red Sea as if they were walking on the sands of a desert? God. Who closed the waters of the Red Sea over the great armies of the Egyptians so that not one lived? God. Who caused even something like, who gave them food for 40 years? Who caused not even their footwear to wear out for 40 years? Who then led them into the land of milk and honey through a flooding river because he allowed the waters to stand up? God. Who brought down the walls of Jericho and gave over to the children of Israel the cities and the peoples that inhabited Canaan. God. I could go on and on and on and on. Who gave his one and only beloved son and then crushed him on the cross so that you and I might be saved of our sin? God. So summon up, call, recall, remember who God is and what he has done. Are we a little bit like the king of Israel saying, God has brought us to this point to wipe us out? Or do we go to the fire like the martyrs of old, singing the praises of our God? Summon up. I don't think I need go on. Think of what God can do. It's a small thing, an easy matter, a simple thing for God to do. Simple to give them water. Simple to give them victory over Moab. And then lastly, to slog away. There's something you and I have to do. Something the children of Israel have to do. And that something that they have to do was to slog away. Now don't forget those soldiers had been marching for seven days. In a desert. In the heat. I don't know how many of you did forced marches. Yeah. Um, you will know. And this was uh, in a dry wadi. A wadi is a river, a dry river bed. And that wadi formed the boundary of Moab and Israel. And that wadi was usually dry, bone dry, except for the dust at the bottom. And God says, without wind, without lightning, without anything else, I will bring the water to you tomorrow. Go and dig ditches. Now, I wonder if we could look at two quotes from Spurgeon. I'm going to read them to you. If we expect to obtain the Holy Spirit's blessing... We must prepare for his reception. Make this valley full of trenches is an order which given to Spurgeon, he says, 
is given to me every this morning in the church for the members of the church. Make ready for the power of the Lord. Be prepared to receive that which he is about to give. Each man in his place and each woman in her sphere. Let us make this whole church full of trenches for the reception of the divine water. The floods we will receive. That's one. And the second quote, but the way of faith and the road to the blessing is this. God has promised it. We must get ready for it. God is engaged to bless. Let us be prepared to receive the boon. Act not on the mere strength of what you have, but in expectation of that which you have asked. When you pray for folk in the church, the metrics that start exams this week, when you pray for those who are sick, Pat and Gail and Angela, Mike, Jeff, uh, Dr. Paul, Dave Kilfoyle, who's just broken his hip, um, Balmy's husband, Ken, who's just broken his forearm. Do you pray expecting to receive? Or do you pray in disbelief that it's just too hard for God? Do you pray according to the scriptures, as Michael led us this morning? Do you pray in the will of God? For it may not be God's will that we will all live to be Aunt Edie's age. She was sitting there this morning, very nearly 102 years of age, mentally alert. So we have to ask ourselves, nothing is hard for God. Are we prepared? Let's come back to digging, slogging away with the ditches. What do you think the kings and their commanders, kind of reception they had from their men when they came back to them and said, right guys, grab a shovel, get stuck in, we need trenches, ditches, pits, everything all over this dry landscape. Would the men have been happy? Would they have looked skywards and said, looks if it's going to rain? Where's the water coming from? They were thirsty, near dead men in the middle of a desert. And I'm sure that they didn't look forward to digging ditches. But it is something we need to remember. God wants us to prepare for the blessing from him. And you know what? Digging ditches may have not appealed to them. But it was not too difficult for three armies to put into practice. It was not beyond them. They could do it. And then the next morning, the water flows when it's time for the grain offering. Now, in the NIV, it says sacrifice. But reading through, it seems if grain offering is, is more correct. Now, when ancient Israelites offered up their grain on the altar, what were they doing? They were thanking the Lord for his mercies and for supplying their need. And they were thanking him for his mercies and supplying their need. And the water flowed in and filled the ditches and the trenches and the pits enough for all of them to drink. According to instructions in Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, the grain, which was either raw or made into cakes, and those cakes were similar, I suppose, to our kind of modern pancakes, they were the daily staple of many of those people. And offering such things symbolized the need to dedicate, what? Every aspect of their lives to the Creator, to God Almighty, including their labor by which they had coaxed 
the grain from the soil. And so God filled the land with water. They had obeyed God's word. If they had not obeyed God's word, the water would have flown right past them or perhaps not even arrived. Came from the mountains in Edom. And so these thirsty men and animals had their thirst slaked by the Lord. But the ditches were not the blessing. The water was only part of the blessing for victory over the Moabites was indeed the blessing which was to come their way. And not only did God do that, but when the Moabites rose in the early morning and they looked out, they hadn't seen wind, they hadn't seen clouds, they hadn't seen anything happening. And yet they saw what looked to them like blood. And God gave them over to that belief that the kings had fought amongst themselves. And so they rushed down, not even prepared to fight. They rushed down to get the plunder of the dead bodies. And the Israelites rose up and defeated them. And we know that they not only defeated them, but they took city after city. They put the peoples to the sword. They filled up the springs. Every man carried stones onto the good fields. And then the king of Moab has this desperate move. His move is to get 700 swordsmen and cut his way through to the king of Edom. It fails. Now, who did the Moabites worship? God? No. They had different gods, one of which was Chemish. And what did they do for Chemish? What was the sacrifice? Well, parents often sacrificed their own children to their God. And so this king sacrifices his eldest son who is next in line on the walls of his city so that all see. And sadly, that raises them to hysteria and to stiffen the resistance. And Patterson says this as a comment, sickened by the maddened specter of senseless human sacrifice, the allies lifted the siege and returned to their homes. You know, the sad thing is that they did not complete the battle. They did not complete the victory. And so if we go to um, a few chapters further on, 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 to 21, we read this. Now when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, came, went down to him and wept before him. My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elisha said to him, take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, draw the bow. And he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. And he said, open the windows eastward. And he opened it. And Elisha said, shoot. And he shot and he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the victory, arrow of victory over Syria, for you shall fight the Syrians in Apec until you have made an end of them. And he said, take the arrows. And he took them. And the, he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them. And he struck the ground three times and stopped. And then the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. And here's what goes on in verse 20. So Elisha died and they buried him. And bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. 
you see the people of Israel and Judah and the Edomites had not completed what God had sent them to do. And so the Moabites rose up again. So no wonder, you know, we talk about digging ditches, but no wonder that eventually in that stone that I spoke of right in the beginning, and I quote R.C. Sproul, Mesa, the king, claimed to have freed his land from subjugation to Israel and boasted that Israel has perished forever. Chemish glorified. Do we sometimes turn away when things look really grim? Other way. Just by way of application, if I may end with these. Seek God's guidance to know his will. Do you know where to go to seek God's guidance? Well, Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 2, on many past occasions and in many different ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. And you can quickly skip on to 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Dig ditches in your Bible. Here's an interesting, fairly um, recent result from the Bible Engagement Center. 40,000 people between 8 and 80 were studied with regard to their reading habits in America. Now imagine that you're in hospital and uh, you're lying there and you're watching your monitor. Got it? You're watching your monitor. If you read the Bible one time a week, even if it's in church and it's read by your pastor, there's virtually no effect on that line. It's straight lined. If you read it twice a week, it's negligible. Now here comes the big difference. If you read in your Bible three times a week, there's a little blip like a tiny heartbeat which is developing. And if you read it four times a week, that spike goes right up off the chart. Interesting, isn't it? Do we like the old idea of one quick verse in the morning? Now, what, how does it affect these people? Well, it says, if you're feeling lonely and you read your Bible four times a week, you will feel less lonely by 30%. Your anger issues would have improved by 32%. Bitterness and relational issues by 40%. If you're an alcoholic, that desire will give you a 57% chance of beating it. Now here's a big one. I'm going to end with this one for this part. If you're feeling spiritually stagnant and you read your Bible four times a week, it improves by 60%. You know, how can you feel spiritually alive if you're not digging ditches in the Scriptures? How can you? Because you don't know. So when the king's son is, is burnt as a sacrifice to Chemish, we kind of accept that that's the way it must be. Or when God tells us to do something, like dig ditches, we say, Lord, that's, that's not for me, that's just too 
hard. But if you dig ditches in Scripture, you will unearth grace upon grace upon grace. Now, the second one is sing God's songs. I don't want to get, spend too much time here. But again, I want to go back to that New Testament reading which I gave you. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to reckless indiscretion. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. How do you sing when we sing in church? How do you sing when, when you're alone? How do you sing when you're lonely, when you're angry, when you're tired, when you're depressed, when you're downhearted? Do you sing with a critical spirit? I, I don't like that song. Or do you sing with joy and abandon in the Lord of Lords? Do you give yourself over in that song to glorifying God? And I'm sure that if you do, whether they're golden oldies or the newest song that we learned this morning, lovely words, that, that song this morning, you will thrill to those words. And grace upon grace you will find unearthed. So what do we speak to each other about? Well, we speak to each other about the weather. We speak to each other about the rugby. The bulls are back, by the way. We speak to each other about this and that and the next thing. We speak to each other about our aches and our pains, especially at my age. We speak to each other about the difficulties we have at work. Do we speak to each other about the Lord? in songs and psalms. Number three, summon up and remember God's power. Now, I spent a lot of time on that point, but just keep your mind, it's not you, it's all of God. All of God. Look back in Scripture, think back in your life, and see where God has picked you up and carried you. See his steadfast love for you. And his unbreakable promises. And his, his unspeakable mercy and grace. And just rejoice. I look back on my life. And I see some of the things that I could have done, would have done, and perhaps the Lord in his providence stopped me doing. And I thank him for his grace. And lastly, slog away digging ditches so that you may unearth grace. Do not become discouraged. Don't suffer from Angus's grumbleitis. Do not give up on God. Do not give up on the Father for the things of this world. It's a poor exchange. It's not even an exchange. Go to God Almighty, Jesus your Savior, and the Holy Comforter only, and walk in his pleasing ways. And if the going looks hard, simply seek the face of God. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that the enemy was defeated. We thank you that water flowed. We thank you that the war was won. We thank you that your cause prevailed. We thank you that you received the glory. And folks, it will be the same for you and for me if we are faithful ditch diggers. To know God's will and to keep his guidance. To hear his voice and to sing his songs. To lighten your burden and remember his power. To experience God's blessing 
go forth and dig ditches for Christ and his kingdom. Amen.